by the Neckar River at Rottenburg or the Limmat at Zurich. For nearly half a century, I led Anabaptist pilgrimage tours. Where Dutch Dirk Willems was burnt at Aspirin, I shared his iconic story from the Martyr's Mirror. More than a thousand travelers listened in. Where a special stone stood silent, I tried to give it words. As Kodachrome gave way to film and video, our cameras, though often shaky, found two steady themes. One was the sword. Did Jesus really give to Peter the sword that Roman Constantine took on? The one that Charlemagne still holds on a Christian tower? The badge of noble Roland's knightly honor? The weapon peasants frightened landlords with? The one protecting Martin Luther's faith? And Ulrich Zwingli couldn't do without? This was never a joke to us, whose men or Simons wrote, Iron spears and swords we leave to those equating human blood with swines. Our second theme was singing everywhere. Whether on Orange Day in Holland, preserving melodies of old Ukraine, yodeling in the Bernice Oberland, or learning Christian tunes in Paraguay. We sang ourselves with many a long amen, unpolished serenades to newfound friends. We sang right where the sword once stopped the singing, and when gathering at a river to baptize. Now, for my ever-growing family circle, my patient Salford Church that saw me off so often, my fellow pilgrims, and for any who'd have liked to come along, it's time at last to tell how, from the age of 43 in 1973 to 88 in 2018, I so often led the way to where a Christian town in Switzerland gave death to Felix Mons and old Hans Landis by water and the sword. This might not be precisely where Felix Mons was drowned. It was probably a little farther up that way at the foot of the Lindenhof. But this was the execution place, all right. You're not turned on, right? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. yes. You're, not. Okay. You're not. I'm not. Okay. Is there a lesson there? <laughs> Now let's keep on walking past that bridge there to the next bridge, and then we'll walk over to the Grossmister. We need to be there for service in about three quarters of an hour. Can you hear me, folks? Yes. Wonderful. This is all about the history of the Reformation. On the other side, the entrance to the church, it'll be the Bible stories. Now let me point out just a few of the features here. Here is Zwingli riding off as chaplain to the Protestant forces. Here we will visit tomorrow. Uh, milk soup stone. Here's Martin Luther, see his thick neck, debating over the meaning of communion, and they couldn't agree. It's just as beautiful on the other side, and just remember that Ulrich Zwingli opened a Greek New Testament, and instead of turning the other way and speaking in Latin, he talked to the people and he said, now I'm gonna to talk to you in your own language. And when they heard the Sermon on the Mount, it was a sensation, because they had never heard that before. These people had never heard that in their own language. 
in the fall of 1968 with wife Roma and our Don, Jay, and Philip, we left on Iceland Air's propeller plane on a sabbatical to Hamburg, Germany. I taught American literature in the university there with an office 11 floors above the Audi Max. We immediately bought a VW minibus and went exploring in the ancestral countryside. Nearby was the last home of Menno Simons, the Menokata, with its century surviving Menno Linden tree. I struck a friendship with Peter Fote, new pastor of Hamburg's Mennonites. He took us to the village of Nienrata, where he preached to a little household congregation of resettled World War II refugees from Poland. With tears still trickling from the loss of their ancestral farm, they built a new life. Peter set us off on touring from Copenhagen to Athens. We drove through communist East Germany to the imperial Habsburg city of Vienna, a visit to the oldest Anabaptist congregation in Switzerland, and as far as Athens and Rome. I brought a friend, Jan Gleistein, from Scottsdale, Pennsylvania, because, after growing up in Amsterdam during World War II, he had bicycled the Anabaptist History Trail and was writing a travel book. He now joined our family on a 3,000-kilometer journey. I was getting footage for a documentary, and Jan had the knowledge I totally lacked. Dreaming with Jan at Scottsdale was Arnold Cressman, a native of Ontario and co-founder of the company that would be called Tour Imagination. Jan followed me up with artistic envelopes. He helped us to plan a local historical celebration and fostered what he called a Martyr's Mirror Project. After I led friends on a European tour in 1973, Jan and Arnold made me a chaplain for another one. I'd no idea then I'd stop teaching Moby Dick and talk about history for the next 44 years. But there in Friesland, I started to tell our story, taking our travelers to the tiny village of Pingham, where a careless young priest named Menno Simons had his first assignment. The church tower stands today as it stood then, while up the street is a later so-called Little Hidden Church. In the Frisian language, it's called Menno's Place of Admonition. Hidden from public view by the normal-looking frontage of a house, I'd no idea then I'd ever come again. Nearby, in the town of Berlikum, we visited the Mennonite pastor, and after she died, got to know the young family that had moved in. High school teacher and nurse, Onidas and Janscha Sitzma, and two little daughters. They would make us part of their home as their daughters grew up. When, untypically, Oneidas himself was baptized, my wife Roma made him a frock tour certificate and was rewarded in turn with the gift of a Frisian biblical sampler. I found Roma's poster on Menno Simons' 500th birthday in the nearby village of Wismarsum. The edifice where he was the leading priest there has been replaced except for the bell that called his flock to worship. Its tones still evoke the time when Menno's heart, as he put it, trembled in his body as he read the scripture with new eyes and felt the Christian church must change. True evangelical faith cannot lie sleeping he would have scorned the 19th century monument in his memory, but not his favorite scripture verse. No one can lay another foundation than the one that is laid, Jesus Christ. When J.B. Taves explained, I listened with respect. 
where once a Mennonite congregation met nearby, a modern abstract structure takes its place. This is flat Friesland, laced with waterways, and water familiar local folks like Aryan Hoagland know how to share enjoyably with visitors. The lovely sheep grazed North Sea coast above the former Zuiderzee is now connected by a lengthy dike in the province of North Holland. It's one of the world's great engineering feats, designed by Cornelis Lely, a Dutch Mennonite. It made possible a whole new province called Flevoland. Living with water and traveling around it and with it is second nature in the Netherlands. The Zaan River north of Amsterdam has been called the world's first industrial center. Young Peter the Great came here from Russia to learn Dutch technology and culture. He asked the Mennonites to preach him one of their sermons and took a Mennonite doctor with him back to Russia. A modern museum on the Zahn celebrates traditional Dutch folk culture. The city of Amsterdam was the location of the largest Dopskazin congregation. Its meeting house at the Sign of the Lamb on the Singel Canal is nicknamed the Singelkerk. Like all early Dutch Mennonite meeting houses, it had to be hidden so as not to attract attendance. After the years of persecution, it became elegant, though today the attendance is minimal. We took a canal ride on every visit to Amsterdam, and at every turn we made, there was history, a unique perspective. It's a small country, but with beauty on an industrial scale. Its wholesale flower business converges at Alsmeer, where hundreds of buyers, in constant touch with their home companies, make their bids and get instant confirmation. With split-second thrusts that send their purchases on their choreographed way to international destinations. It looks as though John Sharp might find this fun. The Rijksmuseum is one of the world's best known. One exhibition features the portrait of an affluent Mennonite woman Growing wealth in the 17th century floated a golden age of Dutch genre painting. Subtlety instead of glamorous stylization made ordinary subjects fascinating. Vermeer on household atmosphere, Van Rysdale on a common rural scene, Rembrandt able to evoke both youthful promise as well as the sad weariness of a biblical prophet and the humble devotion of his own mother's scripture reading. We had to go to Berlin to view Rembrandt's portrait of a Mennonite minister discoursing on the word. For me, a triptych by the earlier Hans Memling, kept today in Brugge or Bruges, has been important. Fascinated by the heavenly scene shown partially in one corner, I snapped a forbidden photo and was angrily scolded for doing so. But when I showed it to my wife, Roma, she filled the circle out in a frock tour, which has been on our living room wall for over 30 years. The Westphalian town of Münster was a very special stop on our tours. It's actually named for the Münster, or great church, at its heart. The word itself recalls that the town began as a monastery. Dome is the German word for cathedral, seat of a bishop. The simplicity of the Romanesque towers contrasts with the tracery of Gothic additions. A very popular draw inside the church is a famous clock telling the story of the wise men coming to see Jesus every day at noon.
For decades I came here annually with Wilmer Martin, who became owner of Tour Imagination. The secular Gothic facade of the old town hall recalls the signing of the Peace of Westphalia there that ended the awful Thirty Years' War. St. Lambert's Gothic Tower is what we really came to see. Watchwoman Marge is the latest in six centuries to sound the trumpet she explains to John. It tells the city someone watches them. And when evening approaches, all is well. All was not well when three alarming cages took bodies of fanatic Anabaptists, tortured to death and publicly displayed. Their leader, Jan of Leiden, had seized power with sword-brained other Anabaptists. The town's long story is celebrated along its central streets on manhole covers, such as for the Peace of Westphalia. The Anabaptists, too, are recalled, with charismatic flames around a buried jar of water, remembering baptisms. We go to Zurich for the Anabaptist breakthrough we prefer, which is a decade older than the Münster episode, and the ancestral track of faith still followed centuries later among plain American Mennonites. This is the place where Ulrich Zwingli's voice sounded the Christian gospel with amazing power that woke our own reformers to their task. The friends we just met. They're on their honeymoon. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Let's see how good they are on Sunday school. Huh? <laughs> These are all biblical stories from the Old and the New Testament. Here we have your last supper. There's Jonah. You know what that is. Feeding of the 5,000. Okay. How about this one? Jesus at Gethsemane. Here. He's praying. Across the square, a motto used to show why Anabaptists gave up Swingley as their guide. From this house, he went with Zurich's army to Koppel, where he died for his faith. Notice the name of the street here the Neustadtgasse, the New City Alley, and we're going to go up a little farther on the Neustadtgasse. So let's just walk up here. There is a fountain. The house in which the baptism took place no longer exists, but there's a fountain right on that spot. So we'll gather there and think about what happened there. It was in the Munt's house that in uh, Saturday evening, uh, January 20. Um, one, 1525, about 16 people were gathered. The Anabaptists, or the proto-Anabaptists, the ones who were thinking about baptism, had been given a chance to debate. And then they were declared defeated, and then the town council passed a rule that uh, all babies had to be baptized within eight days. So they had this discussion, and there was a visiting priest here from eastern Switzerland in Coeur. His, name was, uh, his nickname was George Blaurock, George of the Blue Coat. And he, um, they, they said, what's our next step here? We are now illegal, and we'll have to get out. And uh, they had prayer. And when they apparently rose from prayer, Georg Blaurock, this priest, said, turned to Conrad Grebel, the man who Zwingli had said was going, to, was going to be the Greek professor in his new seminary. And Georg Blaurock says, Conrad, for God's sake, give me the true Christian baptism. And Conrad Grable baptized George Blaurock. That's the beginning. That's when our fellowship began. And uh, they went around the circle and baptized everyone. Next, we'll walk down to the memorial to Ulrich Zwingli. Looking back to where he came from, he was a, a peasant's son, but he was brilliant, a natural brilliant man. He could play musical instruments. Zwingli was greatly influenced by the Renaissance scholar Erasmus of Rotterdam, 
then teaching at the University of Basel. The sculptor's joining the sword of the flesh and the sword of the spirit speaks to us as Mennonites. Our Conrad Grebel said no to that double grip. Zwingli said, yes, we must be realistic. Conrad said that we are to follow Jesus, who said, love your enemies. And Menno Simons wrote, our sword is the word of God. Urs Loy is in charge of the old document section of Zurich's central library. But the normal Proshauer Bible had uh, this size here. <laughs> This is a folio Bible. This edition in Swiss German was uh, first published in 1531. And this was the so-called Family Bible, Zurich Bible, Froschauer Bible, Zwingli Bible. Uh, this, these names all means this book. There are three very important texts for the Anabaptists and the history of the Anabaptists. First, the Bible. Second, later than the Martyr's Mirror. And this copy here is printed in Ephrata, Pennsylvania in 1748. Curator Loy has inventoried Froschauer Bibles taken to America by Mennonites. I gave him a copy of my memoir with a wall painting by my wife quoting, the earth is the Lord's in the Froschauer idiom. So I'd like to present that to you. For six decades, the Zuricher Oberland, northeast of Lake Zurich, has been a goal for almost every Anabaptist history-seeking pilgrim. In this once thinly populated region, next to the border of the canton of St. Gallen, lived Anabaptist families with names like Graf, Hess, Oberholzer, and Weber. For centuries, a local tradition harked back to the time when Anabaptists forbidden to assemble by both church and civil authorities in Zurich, secretly found their way to an isolated cave. They came by foot up a hill above Barrettsville in search of a place to gather, read scripture, hear preaching. I brought my family here first in 1969, the year when a beautiful Dutch hymn text was translated into English. It's the first song in the hymn book we use at Salford. And as we climb the path, I remember my own congregation singing. When some hunters came here and the dogs ran ahead of them, they ran into the back of this cave, which was open at that time. And when they emerged, they had kitchen utensils in their mouths, which meant that people actually hung out here, hid here, and they actually lived for a while. But they would basically come here because it was so remote. And many thousands of people have visited here in the last half century. Before that, it was very seldom visited. But for us, it reminds us of starkness, of remoteness, of retreat, of quietness. And it was a great pleasure to meet here where you see other people that you knew had the same things in their conscience. So it's a privilege for us who live in comparative luxury to try to check in with, well, all you've got is theme and people. They were slain with the sword, destitute, afflicted, tormented. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they, without us, should not be made perfect.
Could there be a greater contrast than between a cave in Zurich and the Baroque Catholic Cathedral in Schwitz? Einsiedel, meaning hermitage, is named for a devout Christian hermit named Meinrad, who was killed by ruffians. Over the centuries, it became a favorite pilgrimage goal and developed into a Benedictine cloister. Its iconic symbol is a sculpture of the Madonna and her infant son, both turned a lustrous black by the candles of unending visitations. I came here year after year in time for the Evensong to listen to an echo of medieval spirituality as the monks daily sang their solemn Salve Regina, Hail to the Queen. My first group in 2017 came in April, celebrating our Salford congregation's 300th anniversary. We were met by unseasonable weather. We tried to make the best of it, and in spite of the unfriendly chill, held a symbolic meal. In August, I came back with a larger group in much more pleasant weather, to what is called the Milchsuppenstein, the place where instead of war, a meal of milk soup was shared. Here is the banner for Zurich. Here is the banner for Schwitz. on the other side. This is the border right here. So you're in Schwitz. That's the town of Zug. And that's the Zugersee right behind it. What happened here in 1529, there had been some unfriendly acts by Schwitz to a family in Zurich. And Ulrich Zwingli, who was really the leading spirit of Zurich at that time, said, this has to be avenged. We have to teach them a lesson right now. So he marched soldiers down here from Zurich. They came, Catholics, they were Protestant, Catholics came this way and they met here, and while the leaders were dickering and talking, the people who were actually going to get killed and kill themselves said, Hey, what's this all about? So they said, What do you have? We've got soup. What do you have? We've got bread. So you shared the bread and the milk, and this is the milk soup stone here. So they all had the meal together and went home. <laughs> but they came back again. This time with Zwingli himself along, with a sword at Koppel, which is just over the hill here. And uh, they fought it out and uh, the Catholics won. And they caught Zwingli and they cut him in pieces. But this is our kind of monument, isn't it? It sure is. Where they had a meal together. You know how to do that, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's why I brought you up here. To see Thank you. The falls at Schaffhausen, at the top of Switzerland, recall Ulrich Zwingli's statement that the gospel, if rightly preached, is as unstoppable as the Rhine. I met a native of this region at a meeting in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, in 2005. She was one of 20 Reformed pastors seeking reconciliation with descendants of Anabaptists their forerunners had persecuted. She had given Bishop Lloyd Hoover a Bible that her ancestors had confiscated from his. She had read my book, Conrad Grebel, Son of Zurich. Stopping at her church at Tangen, near Schleitheim, I asked Sabina Ashman about a little monument she had commissioned. Local farmer Wilfried Loy told me it was in fields where he was in charge. He said he could take us by wagon around the so-called Anabaptist climb, the Teuferstieg, to an upland meadow where Anabaptists with names like Moyer and Rosenberger 
once met for forbidden worship. It would have taken us half a day to come and go by foot to the recently laid rugged and humble reconciliation stone awaiting our attention. So I think we should hear first from Doris Brodbeck uh, from the Schleidheim Reformed Church. She will speak from the angle of the people who thought of this and put it here and why. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it was in 2004 that a colleague of mine, um, a minister of Schaffhausen, she um, had the idea to lay down such a stone made by an artist here with stone of this region and he thought that it should not be something big like this uh, but something you can stand around. The artist said that this is a kind of a mashtab. It is on the one hand a measuring stick. There are standards in life. There are some things that you want to conform to and the Anabaptists felt that in the Berg predict, in the Sermon on the Mount, they had found a mashtab, a way to live. Not just theory, not just doctrine, but a way of life. Instead of the Ten Commandments, you have the eight uh, uh, blessings. Also, he says, it can be seen as a division, talking about how people are divided by ideas, by convictions, mm -hmm. by place on the earth, but also it could be considered a seam that unites. The same things that could divide us can also unite us. And what are these little hills? Human communities and places, multiple, various, and then three little crosses representing three executions. That's how serious it got. And so this is not a proud stone, it's a stone of remembrance. And it's very, I would say to, to American Mennonites, it's precious. And I want to give John honey from this region. It is uh, with the Teufelweg, with Anabaptist way. <laughs> and um, can we put that on our bread this evening? Yes, you can. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Colmar in Alsace proudly honors its son, the sculptor Auguste Bartholdi. The Statue of Liberty is on here. The forty-foot model of his greatest work appeared here in 2004, 118 years after his Statue of Liberty was installed in the harbor of New York. We often went to Colmar's Unterlinden Museum to experience an even more famous work of art, the so-called Isenheimer Altar, a triple triptych from around the year 1500, was created for a chapel serving sufferers from painfully inflamed skin. The unspeakable agony of its crucified Christ shows in the ghastly hue and sores of his body and the anguished facial expression. The crossbeam bends downward with the weight of the world's sin. Paul Tillich called this the greatest German picture ever painted. Karl Barth kept a copy above his desk. There's heavenly delight in the birth of Christ. Gravity claims swords and soldiers, while solid rock is sucked upward by what looks like the power of an atomic explosion. Mennonites in Alsace today speak and worship in French, which replaced German after the French takeover in World War II. The lush vineyards at the foot of the Vosges mountain range 
rank amongst Europe's premier tourist attractions. The names of its old walled towns are now French, Reichweiler having become Ricavir. Here, where Anabaptists were jailed and tortured, we may photograph, shop, and dine. Clashing Allied and German armies have left many cemeteries in Alsace. Among the 5,000 German markers at Bergheim, tour members named Kraker and Sommer can find their own family names. On the horizon looms a symbol of older wars. Old Königsburg stands on the ridge of the Vosges that divides Alsace and Lorraine. Once a residence of the aristocratic Tierstein family, it has been romantically restored by the French government as a prototypical late medieval castle concept. Ça va, Arlen? Yeah. Vas-y, top. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> yeah. The Tierstein family motif is a tear or an animal. Mennonite descendants pronounce this as Durstein. Inside and out, a visit to Old Königsburg is like watching a historical documentary. A little north of the Haute Königsburg, the peaceful wooded community of Salm attracted quiet seeking Amish families with names like Gerber and Kupferschmidt. The French Revolution was not their song. Robespierre called them simple hearts, allowed to dig without taking the sword. They planted an oak in gratitude. Now, children of Jacob Amon's flock can share melodies unchanged since then at song. Of course, the oak, as a symbol of peace, also reminds us of one of Anabaptism's greatest splits. <laughs> the Amish men and I split. He I'm went a, I'm and I, I she's went Amish. Amish. In the neighboring rural landscape is St. Mary of the Mines. Jacob Amon moved here from his native Bern to a farm that can still be identified. In 1694, he called a meeting at Onenheim in a mill where in 1660, Swiss-born Mennonites had signed on to a confession of faith from Holland, but that unity was not to last. This is a place where the division occurred. How many of you have Amish background somewhere? <coughs> so that they may be one. one. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So that's ironic that we can here speak of reconciliation at a place where there was the opposite. And yet we're sort of reconciled, aren't we? There is a level in which we are all reconciled. And looking back at 1694, it triggers a little bit of sadness, doesn't it? The same water is flowing here. It's peaceful. And yet, our ancestors said to each other, we really don't want a fellowship. We don't have enough in common. You think we've learned something since then? Well, anyway, this is the place where we can think about that. Are we going to sing a song here? Well, how about shall we gather at the river? Yes, we'll gather at the river.
North of Alsace, the war-ruined Palatinate bloomed under Mennonite immigrants with names like Brubaker, Detweiler, Kraybill, and Mellinger. The impoverished Swiss refugee became proverbial as a land restorer par excellence, bringing along his crop rotation and clover. Our touring North American farmers admire the soil's response to human care. The Nibelungen Bridge over the Rhine at Worms was built just before the coming of the automobile. The town itself dates back to the time of the Caesars. Its Romanesque cathedral, badly damaged in World War II, has been carefully restored. The town's rich history, celebrated in Wagnerian opera, includes a day in 1521 when spiritual lightning struck. Here stood Martin Luther, defying papal and imperial authority. We gather at a monument based on the majestic hymn, A Mighty Fortress. Seated at Luther's feet are his reforming predecessors, John Hus, Savonarola, Peter Waldo, and John Wycliffe. Young Emperor Charles V listens to the monkish challenge. Here stehe ich, ich kann nicht anders. Here I stand, I can do no other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. Armed only with the scripture, Luther is a portrait of courage. Yet in front of him stand noble protectors, Philip of Hesse and Frederick the Wise of Saxony. Is there a lesson here? Frederick hid Luther in the chilly Wartburg Castle, where with his feet on a whale's vertebra, Luther translated the New Testament into marvelous German. Just westward, upstream on Borms's little Prim River, Mennonite refugees rented or purchased hofs. The Primerhof was bought by Joost Kraybill. The family name means Crow Hill, Kreuenbühl, from down in Bern. For years I talked with Katharina Fellman and her brother here, the last of the family on the Hof. She said that she dreamed she'd have guests, and now here we were talking together. She'd said she had six ancestors named Jacob Kulp. Her body now rests on the Hof, whose new Swiss-born landlord welcomes visitors. We have about four or five the troops coming over the year, yeah. and then I'm the translator. Ah, yeah, to, uh, the owner of it now. Yeah, to, yeah. to translate. Vielen Dank. Yeah. Farming seemed simpler here on our earliest tours. The Weierhof buildings seemed colorless and drab, but later the Adamshof, where Kraybills once worshipped, could sparkle. What's that rustling across the lane? Why, it's my own grandson, Peter Nelson, an MCC farming trainee. A Crayonbühl side hoof that had also gone quite dingy is glistening once again, too. Looking up toward the village center, we recall a crowded old attic explained by an older trainee who since then has inspired a new building project that has become a historical jewel an archive and research center. Welcome to the Melnitische Forschungsstelle at Weierhof. My name is Gary Waltner. I was born and raised in Bremen, South Dakota. And I did my PAX work in Germany. 
the historical society approached me and asked if I would be willing to take over the historical collection. Today, Gary Waltner's Forschungsstelle attracts items from all over Germany, like the copper plates from the martyr's mirror itself, symbols and names, transgenerational meaning. Whether for Kalbs, remembering their home village, or Stauffers, still keeping the family Froschauer Bible brought up from the Emmental to Ebersheim along with their Swiss affection for the earth, a memory carved devoutly by Fritz Kerr, preserving thoughts of the sad northward flight that brought his people up to the Palatinate, a journey we'll reverse, sailing back up the Rhine. Approaching Bern from the east takes us over the subalpine Susten Pass. Built with tourism in mind, it's only open in the summer. At the top, I have a drink of Ovomaltine. This is as high as we get on our tour, and I have this drink every year. It tastes just like breakfast 70 years ago. We used to visit the Steingletscher, the ancient glacier here. But as a victim of repeatedly warm atmospheres, it's no more a high point of our Susten Pass journey. Okay, smile. We okay. left others to watch it retreat in its backward melt. Our expert driver, Jean-Paul Weber, has a sense of humor. <laughs> the glacial downhill streams we follow converge as the Ara River, churning through the gorge bearing its name. Where the Ara spreads out into the Brienzersee, we've come into the canton of Bern. Where cattle return bedecked from the upland Hasletal. Next farther west comes Lake Thun, the Thunersee, where the Ara constricts again and the alpine thrust resumes undiminished. Toon's unmistakable logo was prison for local Anabaptists. At nearby Steffisburg, we can find their familiar names inscribed on a colorful tafel showing the donors of local reformed membership. Our family stories remind us how Anabaptist convictions 
made many such names our own. Folks, we have a very nice resonant room. We should sing a song. This is the Emmental, the Emma River watershed. What in the 20th century was still common on Bernese farms can now be observed at the Show Cheeserai at Atholtern. The flavor of Emmental cheese depends on how long it is aged. They'll serve you right here with fondue or shrink wrap your purchase for carrying home on the plane. An old Emmental farm home is eloquent of roots. This was not a scene our ancestors wanted to leave. But for years they felt hounded and sometimes lived far out back like the Hershey's secluded under the Herlinflu. One father built a barn floor hiding space. On a gentle hill above Langnau, called Dusruti, was a well-known stand of evergreen tannenbäume. The Baumgartner home there, with its beautiful Emmental view, hosted worship, with a text from Matthew 5. A song on that meeting survives in the Ausbund today, recalling the naked sword in a rough fellow's hand, who cursed and swore while making four arrests. The oldest Anabaptist congregation in the world is in the Emmental. Singing has sometimes been called a Mennonite sacrament. From Bern to Boston to Bulawayo, with Mennonites, it's never over till it's over. The picturesque little castle at Troxelwald served as prison for local Anabaptists held there pending their shipment on to the city of Bern. For centuries, this place was notorious in the region's Anabaptist homes for time spent there in incarceration for not having honored church rules. In the countryside viewed from the tower lived the family of Hans Haslibacher. There's a song about him, too, in the Ausbund, of when he was taken to Bern and beheaded there. In the Kafig term, then on Bern city wall, was a list of executions done there. Two brothers imprisoned there copied out the Anabaptist names they could recognize. Hans Haslebacher's name was on that list, found a century later on a Pennsylvania farm. The colonnaded heart of Old Bern, restored after a great fire, is a famous shopping center. Its unique fountain statues intrigue tourists. Living on this street in 1905, young Albert Einstein first proposed his special theory of relativity. The famous old Zietglocke, or clock tower, once at the city's entrance, has become a place to connect. This busker says he's from Hungary. Above him, Father Time, 
with an understudy of Bernie Spears, has been turning the hourglass since the time of the Anabaptists. Nearby, a dark figure stares at Switzerland's tallest Gothic tower. It took a while, there in the Munsterplatz, for us to recognize this as Moses, pointing to the second commandment, thou shalt not make any graven images. He seems to disapprove of what he sees. Sure enough, it's one of Europe's best surviving Gothic portals. Its own warning states, you shall not revere or pray to the images. Yet Catholic or not, this was just too good for the reformers of Bern to smash. After all, it's about the final judgment day. Saint Michael is swinging his all-deciding sword over souls being weighed in the balances. The ones clothed in white will go up to Christ in heaven, while Satan waits for the naked ones in hell. While the foolish virgins droop their lamps and weep, their wiser sisters gloat over their supply. Beneath them, Sheba's queen and Solomon confirm the wisdom of those who are prepared. No wonder those iconoclasts couldn't bring themselves to finish their job. Right here they would erect a stand and uh, they would pronounce judgment and here was where they would behead people, including Hans Haslebacher. There's a song about Hans Haslebacher in the Ausbund that the Amish still sing today. And here's where it would happen. And uh, it was revealed to Hans Haslebacher that the town fountain would run red with his blood. An old man told me that uh, the water ran down and came out on the next street. This would be the main crossing of the original town, okay? Before, when it only went up to that uh, clock tower. Now let's walk down in there and stand in front of the uh, courthouse, the, uh, the Rathaus, Council Hall. Burns' proud counselors had little understanding of their Anabaptist subjects' point of view. So there was great suspicion of the Anabaptists, but it was ironic because they did not fight. And they told the government, look, when you are wounded, we take you into our houses and we'll do it some more, but we will not carry the sword ourselves. Now, what I want to do with you is to go down to where they finally expelled four boatloads, four boatloads. There was one boat of what we would call Mennonites, Reistians, three boatfuls of Amish. Those three boatfuls were distributed on farms in the Netherlands and they gradually over the next century and a half were absorbed into Dutch culture. The Reistians, that is our type, the Mennonites, uh, were much harder to deal with. The Amish were more submissive. That was what they believed. Now, this is the kind of boat they went on. Down the Rhine, take a couple of weeks to get to Rotterdam. Sometimes you can't get in here, we just stand up there and look down here. Oh, there I can see him now. Isn't that we're going to have facial hair? That was one guy. Yay! Is it cold? In the 12th century, a chapel appeared at Rutzbrunnen where a little fountain was sacred to pre-Christian pilgrims. Just to the south looms the dark Hogant range, earlier called De Furga. The Anabaptists here, said the Lords of Bern, were especially tough. It was said they met sometimes in the so-called Robber's Cave, near Shangnau, just above the infant Emma. It was centuries until a sympathetic Bernese pastor spoke up on their behalf. Finally, a bride honeymooning at Shangnau stumbled on their story. We met her in 2017. Katharina Zimmerman is an unusual person. And this is an, an unusual moment because 
in a few weeks her novel that made a sensation in Bern and in Switzerland in 1989 and following will appear in English in the United States. Did you know anything about the Anabaptists then? Nothing. All right. Till I was 25, I never heard the word, not in school, not in university, not in church, never. Did it make an impression on you at the time? Yeah, of course. They, the Anabaptists, had a God who loves. The Reformed Church had a God who is punishing. It was not the farmers who chased the Anabaptists away, because they were neighbors and they were farmers like every other person. It was here in town, the governors of the whole canton, who chased them away and not because of faith. They wanted to make a war against the Catholics, and for a war you need soldiers. When you come to the church and you baptize your child, the baptism is not guilty if the father and the godfather don't um, carry their weapon. The baptism isn't valid of the child if your father is verlos, if he won't fight. And the same with uh, marriages. Marriages. When the young bridegroom came without his, rest, his weapon, his weapon. It was not not gay. legitimate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was this who made them furious oh, here. You think that was the main yeah, reason? Yeah, yeah. I'm convinced. Mm -hmm. This is something new. She made a story out of what is sometimes simply chronology, n lists, names. We knew a lot of this stuff, but this gives us a chance to feel about it. And I think we want to thank you. Three months later, in the old rot house, Katarina was asked to read from her book, Die Furge. The stump on Toon's horizon is called the Stockhorn. At its foot runs the Simma River. We'll drive up in the Simmental to Erlenbach, a little town of double interest to our story. Its reformed church is a treasury of late medieval frescoes paintings done when the plaster was still wet. Hidden for centuries, after the iconoclasts, but now with their stern whitewashing removed. You didn't have to know how to read to take the Bible stories to heart, from the blissful Garden of Eden, to the wise men bringing gifts from the East, the Spirit descending on Jesus, and the sorrow of the crucifixion scene, and what a surprise to learn that Jacob Amon had been baptized here in this church. <laughs> to her imagination, though based in Canada, never expected a serenade with a Canadian song. But a choir from French-speaking Switzerland did us the honors. Another mountain range, the Jura, stands farther north. Anabaptists, invited to its upland fields by a generous Catholic bishop, at last rejoice in quiet living for their families. 
such as the layman's living and farming there today. A herd of Simmentals got in our way as we looked for a ravine with a reconstructed bridge. Here, Anabaptists once hid to worship. Someone carved 1633. This pillar is brand new. It's a series of cylinders, one, two, three, four, five, six, summarizing Anabaptist history here at the uh, Anabaptist Bridge in the Ural. It starts with a baptism, Conrad Grebel baptizing Georg Blaurock in 1525. That's the debut. That's the beginning. Here's Felix Mons drowned, Ma Michael Sattler burned, and here's the Schleitheim article, and so forth. And then they have Menno Simons on here, too, um, look, his fundament book, and 2010, this was put here. So we're at the Anabaptist Bridge, and I'd advise you to turn around, keep moving, and get the bridge itself back there. That's the memorial bridge put there in 2010, where the old Anabaptist Bridge was. Today is July 1st, 2011, Tour Imagination Tour. West Henry Yerger, at 14, was our youngest traveler. He had posed with Menno Simons at Widmarsum, heard about the first baptism at Zurich, thought of being baptized there himself, celebrated with us at the Milchsuppenstein, ridden along to the lonely Teuferstieg, and felt the Haslibacher story in Bern. Growing up in Montana, 200 miles from a Mennonite church, West Henry felt in his grandmother's Bible a connection with her Ohio Mennonite heritage. He used a legacy from her, giving up his baseball schedule to visit his Mennonite heritage, hoping to be baptized. This was unprecedented for tour imagination and for me. That year, 2011, was special in another way. I was asked to bring greetings in the Rathaus of Zurich to a session of the Swiss Reformed Synod. This was arranged by my friend Peter Schmidt of Barrettsville. Discussing West Henry's request, we drove on into Austria. Wo man singt, da lass dich nieder. Where people sing, there you may settle. In St. Gallen, we stopped to see Conrad Grebel's brother-in-law, Professor Vadian, with a book, recalling his scholarly fame. At his foot is a second likeness of him at a fountain. And as we turn back, we see also the sword he carried as mayor of his town. After the spectacular Silvretta Pass, we came to Innsbruck's imperial golden roof, commissioned by Maximilian, who'd paid Conrad Grebel's tuition and had both his wives celebrated. Beneath them is a plaque for Jacob Hutter, burned at the stake in this square, as Werner Pockel relates. Other Hutterite martyrs have a new memorial of boulders, Disappointed to be there when skiing was out of season, we were surprised when a skier practiced anyway. And then we came to Rottenberg on the Inn, the first home of engineer Pilgrim Marpeck, the Menno Simons of the South. Here, West Henry still hoped for baptism. Uh, West Henry, you believe in Jesus, our Savior. You believe in God, the Creator, and our Father. You believe in the Holy Spirit that will come, that has come to you and called you. Yes. Well, I believe we have some water here that once flowed with the blood of our spiritual fathers and mothers. Upon the confession of your faith before God and these witnesses, I baptize you with water in the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit. May God pour out His Spirit upon you as your life long. On Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand Amen. Amen. We followed the inn on to Passau where its gray joins the blue of the Danube in the dungeon there we remembered the birth of the Ausbund, still published in annual thousands for Amish singers today. In Augsburg, we stopped by a much smaller river, the Upper Lech, flowing where Anabaptists worshipped, just before most of them were killed. The owner, repairing the house, gave us an old beam to take home. It's another story in Poland, down the Vistula River from Warsaw, where the Cousin Mennonite Meeting House is now a family home, unlike the meeting house at Wimschle, where we sang old songs inside a crumbling wall. Here, Mennonites lived and farmed until World War II. Following the Vistula northward, we find the Montau Mennonite Church, converted to Catholic use Approaching the Baltic, we saw the world's largest castle, built by Teutonic knights. And in Gdansk, called Danzig, when Dutch-speaking Mennonites came, the great shipping crane from when Danzig led the Hanseatic League. The town's allegory of trade was painted by a Mennonite artist, and its great armory was designed by his brother, of likewise pacifist heritage. A church built by Danzig's Mennonites holds a charismatic fellowship today. In the town of Elbing, one Mennonite church has been converted and another made into a dwelling. Old rural porticos recall the region's once thriving Mennonite farmscape. At a pre-war Bartle family home, Helen and Peter Redekop are delighted to be given a souvenir, buried with clothes and dishes in a barrel when their relatives had fled. On the Vistula too is Krakow, with its picturesque cloth hall market, 40 miles from where darkest Auschwitz still declares, Arbeit macht frei, work will make you free. The same lie in Theresienstadt near Prague, with its phony, unused sinks to fool gullible visitors and unspeakable toilet rows. We read the same German lie at Dachau, while in Alsace we see Struthof's gallows. Ovens that turned flesh to ashes and the drain in the floor for the blood of its slaughter. Along another river, the Dnieper in Ukraine, towers another sword over the city of Kiev. Downstream at Zaporozhye, Mennonites from Prussia tried to make this their homeland, taking the Cossacks' great oak tree at Khortitsa as their own symbol of dwelling. The smaller Molochna, Milk River, gave its name to a larger Mennonite colony. Beside a house built by Mennonites in Ledekop, Jim Yuki is offered a tile from the pre-communist scene and is staggered by the munificence of a Mennonite magnate's house. At a Mennonite hospital, communists placed Karl Marx, along with comrade Vladimir Lenin, whom we also found fronting a Mennonite family's factory. When the village of Eichenfeld took up guns in self-defense, Bolshevists destroyed it. Even for Mennonites, Schwerter, swords, had not stayed beaten into plowshares. It's one thing to see a painting of a remembered farmstead, and another to stand in the actual only part left. 
while land once richly productive now seems to wait empty around the once Mennonite village of Gnadenfeld, the children now growing up there know nothing of the family of Henry Dirks, who in 1923 were brought from here to America by my own Salford congregation. The Neckar River above Heidelberg brings old German Baptist pilgrims to Schriesheim and to the Eder, even holier for them, where their first immersions were held at Schwarzenau in 1708. After they sing at this holy location, I find my wife's work on the wall of their little museum. They're welcomed by Mennonites over in Holland in memory of their ancestors pausing there. Sharing this jovial company, it seemed I was almost taken in myself. Did we go to England? Yes. Looking not for Anabaptist history, but for sites not to be seen anywhere else. One was the meeting house where William Penn had worshipped, and where he and wives Gulielma and Hannah were laid to rest. Another Englishman, Isaac Watts, who wrote the hymn, O God, Our Help in Ages Past, stands by as Southampton's nearby tower daily sounds out the tune of his most famous song. On the Golan Heights, our thoughts turned biblical. To us, this was Mount Hermon, whose melting snows emerging at its foot begin the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee, where baptisms were taking place. Our meditation was led by author Palmer Becker. Wonderful. Delicious. You please eat with us, yes, with family. Yes. He took us into a Palestinian yes, Christian I home. And just as easily into a mosque at worship time. When Palmer explained we'd come to worship too, we were invited to come back again. Settlements mushrooming on land claimed by farming Palestinians and their olive trees were emotional sights, as was the wall built by Israel down Bethlehem's main street. The soldiers equipped with our day's kind of swords, and Islam's Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount. Not to speak of the worship transpiring nearby at a much older wall. by famous rivers on three continents, world conferences of Mennonites sang the same song, first in Zimbabwe in 2003, singing about looking for a friend who is better than Jesus and never finding a better one. When six years later the song came to Paraguay, it took the conference there too by storm. In 2015, at Harrisburg, PA, the swordless song of joy rolled on from heart to heart. (laughs) 
The Kreisgau watershed in Baden-Württemberg is special to my story. It's dominated by an ancient schloss, the Steinsberg. Its nickname is the Compass of the Kreisgau, and there's a literal brass compass in the tower, pointing me out to the village of Weiler at its foot, where my ancestor Hans Ruth had a vineyard. Looking out in the other direction, we see the Immelhäuserhof, the oldest Mennonite farm in Europe. I visited Deacon Emil Binkele there, the last of his flock to live there. Adjacent is the Birkenauerhof, Birch Meadow Farm, with lavish fields still rented from late medieval owners, the Knightley von Fenningen family. At the Rauhof, Freiherr Philip von Gemmingen is the farmer himself. There's Gunter Landis at the Willenbacherhof. We met the latest Muslim at the Birkenauerhof, and a family of funks at the Unterbiegelhof. For decades, the Sauders lived and worshipped in Duren. Where yoga is practiced now, we added our 606. I can tell you a little bit more about EMG. Next, we were greeted at the Buchenauerhof, headquarters of a worldwide mission group. And there, where Oberholzers worshipped, we prayed too. We were also invited to the Ursenbacherhof by Walter Schmutz, its now retired host. He wanted us to realize we stood there with him between the Neckar and the Rhine on this hof, which is now a stop on the Anabaptist Trail, the newly designated Teufelspur. Just northeast from the Steinsberg is the little town of Steinsfurt, where my Alderfer ancestors lived. In 1981, I came on a little museum there on Larkness Street and met its genial founder, Hans Appenzeller. Our friendship would last 36 years. He said there had once been an arrest in the cellar of the old house across the street from his house. In 1661, I asked. He said yes. I said they were Mennonites arrested by a Christian government just as they began to sing a hymn. Intrigued, Hans did research and found backing to restore the house which was to have been demolished. So come on in down here, folks, and talk a little bit. Now I'm 87 and he's 97. This is how it looked when I first came, and Hans gave me that picture and I put it in one of my books. Then when I came back, it looked like this. Amazing. I brought many tour imagination groups to that cellar to renew that song. Hans, a Catholic, always listened appreciatively as we sang words by Nicholas von Zinzendorf. One year, Hans surprised me by saying, you've come now 13 times. That summer, my grandson Isaac Ruth sang there with a high school chorus led by Rod Durstein. Another visitor was M.J. Sharp, who, like Felix Muntz and Hans Landis, would pay with his life for the gospel of peace. Uh, she stands here at the window. Oh, can look? A few months later, Tour Imagination's new owner, Audrey Petkow, and I paid a visit to Steinsfurt's beloved folk historian. We have a Rose. Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. Oh, thank you, sir. It's a cause of Freude. We were hoping that you would be good to hear when we hear two lieders singing. Yeah. The Rose, 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 While swords can send a message to the spine, singing is the language of the heart. Five months before, MJ had paid the price for Christ's new vision of humanity. 
And as we sang, I thought of our daughter Dawn. She'd been 16 when first we crossed the sea, and like MJ, had thought and worked for peace while he was a little fellow at Salford. Singing for Dawn, too, was soul food. From her graduate thesis, she wrote a book on how our faith could pass from heart to heart. Now she was passing on herself at 65. Three months later, Hans Appenzeller died at the age of 97. Go right down then, folks. Theophil Kirsch has helped to design the new Kreichgau Mennonite History Tour on which the old Teufer Keller is a station. He has been a big help between us and the various folks and the people in the church and all that. So he does that. I'm sure he gets very high pay for this. <laughs> pamphlet by Emil Schumacher includes the original list of the singers in 1661. Hans Jakob Hess and his wife, Hans Heinrich Landers and his son, Georg Müller. The family names are familiar to many of us. Hans Jakob Graf, Stift Hoffmann and his wife, Michael Meyer, his wife and daughter, Jakob Gut and his wife, Good. Bernhard Rohr, Rohr. Rohr, wife, son and daughter, Jakob Rosenberger, Rosenberger, Rudolf Landers, Jakob Graf, with five persons, Hans Meyer, two persons, Jakob Nüssler or Nisler, Nisli, we would Nisli say. and wife, and Vincent Meyer. Vincent so Meyer. 53 persons. Mm -hmm. Vincent Meyer is my 11th generation ancestor. Heart with loving heart united, meant to know God's holy will. Let his Traveling is one of life's great pleasures. To see the architecture of another culture and another time. To take a view. To capture the picture and take it home. To listen, to taste, some fun, to observe, to be entertained, to be nostalgic, Would what we saw and learned remain a part of our life? Wisdom on elderly faces. Friendship in the cable car. The stories remembered on stones. The soup where swords were not wielded. Our thanks for the lesson there Words from afar in the cave? When we gathered at the river and our attention was refocused, 
what Christ truly gave his disciples was not just more sword-based tradition that, though meant to protect the faith, had cost our Hans Landis his head and interrupted the singing, but the song itself from the cellar that can flow on from heart to heart. That was our lesson there. Wow.